distance away from what has essentially been a collective barricade in the form of border controls, managed quarantine facilities and isolation, to individual armour that we each can carry around with us in the form of a vaccine. We intend to vaccinate everyone who can be vaccinated before the end of 2021 because this offers the same safety of an elimination strategy but with far greater freedoms and less risk. As a result of the vaccine, 2021 is the year when possibilities begin to open up, when we get to lock in the gains that everyone worked so hard for in 2020. A key opportunity that has arisen as a result of our strategy is quarantine free travel with Australia. There's been much speculation over this. Our position has always been clear. Opening up our borders to our nearest neighbour is a priority, not only for tourism and business, but also in terms of reuniting friends and families. We know what it would mean for people. But we also know that many New Zealanders are nervous. They don't want to put everything we've fought so hard for at risk, and they want us to proceed with the same vein in the same vein as our overall COVID response, and that is with caution. We also know people want certainty. They want certainty about what lies ahead, certainty to make plans, certainty about what the future looks like. What we haven't wanted to do is enter a situation in which New Zealanders' health or lives are at risk once more, or we were unable to offer that certainty. It goes without saying that opening up a green travel zone with Australia without quarantine is highly complex. Officials have been considering and working through these complexities for months. Cabinet today received an update on this work. But before any final decision is made by Cabinet, we'll need to be satisfied that the following conditions have been met. One, that our response framework for when there are cases in Australia is fit for purpose and ready. Two, we have measures in place to effectively contact trace travellers from Australia should we need to. Three, all technical issues are resolved, including transiting passengers and managed isolation fees. When, for instance, passengers arrive in either Australia or New Zealand, but their ultimate destination is different. Four, that we have the appropriate regulatory mechanisms in place. Five, that airlines, airports and agencies are ready. Much work has already been done here uh, with issues like crew separation from high-risk areas and for when they would fly in a quarantine zone, uh, and red and green zones at our airports. Much work has been done there given we already have quarantine tree fr uh, free travel inward from the likes of the Cook Islands. And finally, that the Director General of Health has provided an up-to-date health assessment. Once we've met these criteria, we anticipate we'll be in a position to open the bubble. We understand the need for planning and certainty and talks with airlines and airports has been ongoing. We intend to announce the commencement date for the Trans-Tasman travel bubble on the 6th of April. So just to be clear, we intend to announce the commencement date for Trans-Tasman travel on the 6th of April. Before I open up for questions, I'd like to take a moment to touch on another government priority, and that's housing. Tomorrow, Ministers Robertson, Woods, Parker and myself will be setting out a plan and package to tilt the balance towards first home buyers and increase housing supply. Our government inherited a housing crisis, the problems and challenges of which have been well canvassed, Decades of failure to invest, increasing numbers of speculators in the market, unsustainable house price growth, locking out first home buyers, soaring rent levels and restrictive planning rules. Property investors now make up the biggest share of buyers in the market. Meanwhile, house prices are rising much faster than wages, so homes continue to climb out of reach from many first home buyers. And the New Zealand housing market has become the least affordable in the OECD. It will take time to turn all this around, and unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. But there are things we can do. We have been getting on with this already, things like reforming the RMA, compelling local councils to flip free up land through the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, working with the Reserve Bank to take some demand out of the market, and undertaking the biggest public housing build programme since the 1970s. But we believe there is more we can do. And tomorrow morning, we'll outline a suite of both urgent and longer-term measures. The package will include steps to increase the supply of houses and improve affordability for home buyers and renters. 
or aim to tip the balance away from property investors and towards first home buyers and curb rampant speculation. It is, I believe, a plan that will start to make a real difference to this complex problem. And I look forward to sharing it with you all tomorrow here on the same podium. But for now, open for questions. Jessica. Prime Minister, you talk about giving the giving people certainty. Why not announce a date for the Oz bubble today then? Because we don't have a date for you. You know, I've set out today the things that we are uh, making sure that are ready to go. Uh, and on the 6th of April, we'll then be sharing the date for the opening of the Trans-Tasman arrangement. What I want to do, though, is make sure that when we do that, we know we're ready, that we have a plan in place uh, uh, if in the near term we have an outbreak, and we almost certainly, on either side of the Tasman, will have to deal with scenarios like that. We've got to make sure we have a plan in place to deal with the number of people who could either be in New Zealand or Australia at that time. You've had a year already. Uh, you've, Jessica. You've had a year already, though. Yep, and in that time, uh, on uh, at least 12 occasions, we've met as New Zealand and Australia teams together to work through a New Zealand and Australia arrangement. Uh, that would have meant that we'd be working together on decision makings around when we would shut down the borders or when we might have to cease uh, uh, travel if we had outbreaks. Since that time, obviously, states have opened up. The majority have not. They still remain closed. Our viewers, rather than trying to work through a solution that sees all of Australia with New Zealand, that we can work through an arrangement that sees us operating with some states but not others. Why are we still in a place that you're still you know, having to go through? Sorry, can you start the Why question Why are we in? still in a place where you're still having to check off some of these things, like getting the airports ready, getting the airlines ready? Look, Why isn't that working? Well, actually, no. To be, f to be fair to both the airlines and the airports, a significant amount of work has already been done in those areas. What, of course, is different than what we've been planning through the entire time is we now will have to deal with different circumstances in different states, which does add complexity, but it is not insurmountable. What I would say is that there's no other countries in the world who have been working to an elimination strategy who are now trying to maintain that whilst opening up travel between the two. So we are having to create a brand new rule book. Now, we've done that before and we're doing it again here, but it does come with complexity, particularly for New Zealand, more so than for Australia. Uh, Joe. That state-by-state state approach is not new. Your former deputy back in April last year was both publicly and with his counterpart talking about how it would be easier to work at a state by state level than trying to work with the whole country. So why is it taken until now for the government to catch up and actually be having those conversations? Uh, we never, as both, um, uh, at that time, we were still working on a country by country, uh, two country arrangement because it quite simply was easier. Uh, if you think about it from New Zealand's perspective, um, we're now having to deal with a situation where if you have an outbreak in one state, uh, how you'll then manage travel in surrounding and potentially bordering states in the eventuality that, for instance, they may not close down border travel between the two. It's much more complex for New Zealand than it is for Australia. So we'd always been working country to country. In fact, even after they opened up as states, we were still working on that basis. Our view has been it would be faster if we try and formulate a different arrangement. The last thing I would say is that this does, this change in approach, isn't without risk for travellers. We may have scenarios where travel will shut down one way, and it may therefore leave travellers for a period of time uh, stranded on either side of the Tasman. That's one of the downsides of moving through this arrangement, but it does mean that we can find a solution and open up more quickly. On that topic, Prime Minister. Oh, yeah, I'll come to you, Jane. We've got time. We've got time, everyone. Jane. Just for a separate paper on UA and Cook Islands, and could there be a separate announcement on that in terms of China? Yeah, so we of course have, we have separate one-way inward travel arrangements for Nui and the Cook Islands. Uh, the question has been around uh, return uh, uh, quarantine free travel going in country. So they're already coming here without quarantine. The question is what happens to New Zealanders going into the Cook Islands in Nui. Um, obviously, Nui and the Cook Islands haven't taken the same approach on timelines. Uh, um, one has been a little uh, uh, more willing to wait a little longer than the other. Um, but what I think I'll do is just wait until we've got PM Brown in country on Friday to talk a little more detail around that. Holding up from the New Zealand side in terms of um, a full safe travel kind of bubble, as it were, 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave some. Yeah, I'm going to actually leave some of that because it's it's not just, of course, what's happening on the New Zealand side. It's it's ultimately also um, what's happening on the Cook Island side as well. So I think probably I'd, I'd prefer to speak to that in more detail with Prime Minister Brown with me on Friday. A different time frame to that of the Trans Tasman budget. Uh, we've never said that they necessarily will be linked or on the same time frame. No, oh. so they they don't necessarily have to be um, uh, connected. Uh, uh, yeah, Barry. What makes you think, think, or what is going to change between now and April the 6th that will allow you to uh, tick all the boxes. Work on uh, uh, contact tracing requirements, use of the QR codes, any arrangements around um, testing that may or not be may or may not be required. The final framework for uh, alert, basically, an essentially an alert level system that takes into account multiple states. What can people expect? Uh, on what basis would New Zealand shut down uh, if we had or saw cases offshore? We want to provide a little transparency around that and just making sure that we've got that final readiness in place. What are our expectations of all airlines operating in New Zealand, not just Air New Zealand, around crew separation and so on? So there, uh, there are layers to this, not all of which I'll bore you with now, but it does have a significant layer of complexity. But we feel confident we can announce a date from the 6th. If a New Zealander moves to... Oh, yeah, Henry. What criteria are met? Um, which I think some people would argue they have already been met. If all those criteria are met like or such, how long will it be between that date and the actual announcement? Are they from weeks? Well, months? that would essentially, if I did that, I would be announcing a date, wouldn't I? No, so, what we've set out are the things that we expect that we need to have, you know, even if they haven't been met a plan or some certainty around the date on which they'll be delivered and then we'll be sharing that with you. Um, but I have always said I expect the opening to be soon, so we feel confident enough about where we are now to announce the commencement date on the 6th of April. Do you, if do people... You, yeah, Ben. I'll let do you, do you envision the safe travel advice changing? It's currently that Kiwi should not leave New Zealand under any circumstances. Yeah, so... Uh, when there is a safe travel yeah, advice? Yeah, I mean, look, obviously that would need to be updated and you'd expect that as, as part of the work that um, we're doing. Uh, equally, Australia, uh, and keep in mind we've operated differently here, We have Kiwis have continued to travel through this period. Obviously they're required to quarantine on return, but they have been able to leave the country. In Australia you have to get a visa, you have to get permission to leave the country, and so they'll have things on their side that they've worked through as well, and I imagine that includes their safe travel guidance too. And that's a nice segue into my question, because it's been reported that the... Um the has been removed. Yes, as you ask for that? Oh, look, it's, it's obvious that as part of these arrangements that would need to be amended, so that has been part of our talks, and so all of this will be in preparation. So if now someone. Have you off the issues with the Australian government and they can focus directly on chatting to states, or how does that work? Oh, so we have continued talks at a federal level because on some occasions some of these decisions, you know, the decisions are being made at that level. Um, so we will, of course, keep up those discussions around how we expect to operate. Uh, uh, what communication we'll have if we're making a decision because at the moment, of course, they tell us when they're going to shut down and they tell us when they're going to open up. So we keep, we'll be keeping up the conversations with them about how we anticipate operating. If One of the issues will be that it, it won't always be in parallel. So that's, that's, that's the issue that um, for all of uh, the view that this is a simple thing to deliver, we will see the complexity when we see singular decisions made on one side that could lead to people being stranded. If someone travels, Jessica, to, if and then someone, I'll come to you, Gina. If someone travels to Australia, what? How much warning will they get before uh, the borders close, if any? And what responsibility will the government take for getting them back? And this is this is one of well, the reasons why cabinet is working through. In a lot of detail, the complexity around an arrangement like this, because uh, as you will have already seen from Australia, often there is very little notice uh, when travel ceases. And we will have to operate on the same basis. If we want to maintain uh, a, a situation where New Zealand does not have COVID in the country, if there is an outbreak identified in Australia, and for instance, they're not aware of the source, it is very likely that you would see us close down travel for a period of time until we can be confident of what is occurring. It's not too dissimilar to exactly what we do with our alert level framework. So they're on their own, effectively. If you choose to go over, you have to take that responsibility. This, you know, because as much as, of course, we will want to be inviting Australians to come into New Zealand, and I'm sure, likewise, they'll be wanting to do the same for Kiwis. I think on both sides of the ditch, we will be saying, to make this work, there will be an element of flyer beware. We want to keep this open, we want to keep it moving, but we also want to keep both sides safe. So there may be occasions 
when we take a precautionary approach and for short periods of time travel ceases. Could, could they be on the and so these are some of the things that we're working through as well. You know, if you had a significant outbreak versus something that's smaller and isolated, would we require at home isolation or would there be an occasion where MIQ would be utilised? So you can see the complexity here. We would never have enough MIQ to accommodate everyone who could potentially be in Australia or returning from uh, a particular zone at any given time. Thousands travel between New Zealand and Australia. So these are some of the more complex issues we're having to work through. Oh, look, you know, obviously Damien, Damien will take his view, he, he, you know, lives and works across a particular region that has been hard hit. Um, my view would be that we have all wanted to see the tourism industry back on its feet. But equally, we've also heard them tell us that they want us to keep domestic tourism nice and strong as well. So we're trying to strike that balance around getting our domestic population moving, but making sure we don't put that at risk by adding uh, too early before we've got the safeguards in place another travel zone. So you don't agree with I wouldn't. I, of the I wouldn't. Of the no, I wouldn't express it in that way. I think the industry, by and large, accepts that we've done what we can where we've been able to, but I know it hasn't always been uh, enough from their perspective. Prime Minister, what do you make? Yeah. Uh, Prime Minister, what do you? This is the second time that. Has, has Sorry, I was going to come to Mikey, but okay. Yeah, this is the second time that has probably been, you know, strong comments you don't necessarily agree with. I mean, is he off message here? Is he, is he out of line? Oh, look, I won't. Look, I wouldn't. I won't always express things in the same way as my ministers. You know, I, I expect that will be the case. You know, we're all different people. Prime Minister, what do you think of the SIS releasing its internal report into the lead up to the March 15 attacks? And how confident are you the changes it recommends have been enacted? Well, I am confident that, of course, well, for instance, from the Royal Commission, that we are working through quite a wide ranging uh, program of work, some of which we'd already started work on. So, for instance, they uh, advised that we needed to address the issue that there weren't offences around the preparation of potential terrorist activity. We'd already started work there, but they've also suggested wider uh, uh, reviews uh, be undertaken, and we are kicking that off as well. How much safer are we now from domestic terror threats? Now, I think you've seen uh, uh, in the analysis of our landscape a bit of a consistency since the aftermath. Uh, we know, and we know this because unfortunately of our experience, that we are not immune uh, to threats of domestic terror in New Zealand. What we've got to do is make sure we continually prepare ourselves the best we can. Will you be extending the bright line? Jenna, sorry, I forgot that. Will you be extending the bright line? Oh, I'm not going to be making any announcements relevant to housing uh, until tomorrow. Ah. Yes, I haven't taken you, Bernard, and then I'll come back round to you, Justin, and then Joe. Yeah. On, on MIQ, uh, Prime Minister, yeah. would an Australian bubble free up space within MIQ for um, more people to come from other parts of the world, or will that be set aside as a contingency? Yeah. So I got I got asked about this last week, and actually it was, I think, worth reflecting on the point that Michael Baker has made, which is you, you're freeing up uh, in a... a, a you know, a bit of capacity in MIQ, um, but you run the risk of heightening the risk profile for New Zealand by, by taking what has been low risk uh, or lower risk individuals and replacing them with those coming from higher risk countries. But actually what we're really having to build into our thinking is with that capacity, uh, to what extent it, would it be required for uh, emergency situations in managing the bubble? Uh, or not. And so those are some of the things Cabinet's working through. What I expect is that at the time that we make announcements around the Trans-Tasman bubble, we will also give an indication of how we expect MIQ capacity to be used. So it's, it's possible that it might not increase much at all? Oh, we, look, that's one of the areas where Cabinet is working through how that would be utilised and how it would be apportioned. Uh, and, but we are factoring in some of those issues that are being raised by our experts in the field. In Justin. Of, in terms of the possible kind of snap closures of, of the bubble, we've yeah. a, a, a binational kind of body dealing with this. It, that, could, that could happen. Uh, are you expecting that there's going to be a need for some better 
communications and notification framework for the, for the states to deal with? Well, actually, I think it actually, it, to be um, to be fair, it's actually, I think, improved quite a bit uh, since we had the one-way travel announced. You know, we've become very aware of how important it is to have really timely information flowing to Australia because they are making these significant decisions. My view is that will only continue to be uh, uh, of incredible importance to both sides. Because previously, Australia's decision were affecting predominantly Kiwis. Those decisions now will affect Australians and New Zealand too. So it's in our both our best interest to make sure that we're communicating well, and my view is that we actually are. Our health, of, our health officials talk directly to one another. Will the New Zealand government find itself in a position where it's actually going to have to start telling New Zealanders about shutdowns in Australia rather than waiting for the 6 o'clock news? Uh, we will have to, to, sorry, run that with me again. Will you have to communicate it yourself that Victoria is shutting down instead of what's currently happening where it's mostly shared through the news? On the Victoria side, for instance. Yeah. Oh, well, look, you know, w we would want to make sure that we were making decisions in a timely way. So if we had information that meant uh, uh, we'd met really the threshold where we would want to take a pause, then we would want to move on that very quickly. Yep. Uh, uh, Joe. Just going back to your comment earlier where you said uh, working with uh, Australia as a whole country would be easier than on a state-by-state -state basis. Yeah, yeah. It's just, by and large. Can you kind of explain the logic behind it? Because as it stands at the moment, state premiers are making state-by-state -state decisions, they're shutting borders, opening borders, and doing that amongst themselves. Yes. So having New Zealand as kind of effectively another state in the mix, wouldn't that be a better system? Because you've already got a state-by-state -state system operating. Oh, a, a better system from the perspective potentially of, you know, getting early access. Yes. Um, a better system from the perspective of New Zealand now having to integrate itself into um, some of those mechanisms, it does make it tricky because, of course, uh, uh, if you have, for instance, uh, a case or a series of cases or an outbreak indeed in New South Wales, uh, for instance, uh, you may choose then to say, well, we need to take a, we need to take a closure there. Um, how then do you deal with travellers who might be coming through from Queensland when the, if they don't close their domestic border between the two? Um, they may, but they may not. So then are you closing down to Queensland as well? These are all issues that we need to make sure that we're factoring into the way that we'll work, giving as much transparency around how we'll make those decisions and what travellers can expect. Yeah, Joe. Those circumstances would exist under a whole different set of rules and regulations Anyway. We had previously been trying to negotiate a framework that would um, mean that we had some consistency around the way we were dealing with Australia as a whole. Um, but uh, now those are decisions that we're going to have to individually take on how we're dealing with travel coming in and out of individual states. How much about uh, okay, I haven't taken you. Yeah, I don't have that level of detail around what it would do for, you know, from a licensing perspective. I unfortunately cannot answer that question. But what we what we are thinking about is, you know, will be re what will be really important to us uh, is that when we've got that extra complexity of someone who's travelling in from overseas, um, where our finding services may not be as good, of course, because we don't have as much information about someone who is a a non-citizen or resident, what can we do to enhance our ability to make sure that we can contact people successfully? So How that's some of the things we're working through. How much should the recent... Oh, oh, sorry, Jane. Uh, the I understand a, uh, an approach has been made uh, or, or perhaps correspondence received. I've only just been advised of that, so I want to take the time to receive that properly look at the request that's being made and come back to you officially if I can. Sorry, I've only just been made aware of that. I'll go Jason and then and then just behind How you. How much did the pressure from the likes of Scott Morrison on the New Zealand not having a travel bubble play into your decision? Um, not at all. We've always made we've always made our own decisions on our own terms based on our strategy. Uh, and as I've said a couple of times this morning, uh, I think there's a bit of a view that this work hadn't been underway. We, we had met between New Zealand and Australia 12 times 
trying, trying to work through some of the complexity, and we are seeing that bear fruit now. None of this has been done just in the last week. This work has been underway for quite some time. Are there any specific... Ah, con- uh, yeah. And then I'll come to you, Thomas. Uh, why is there only one uh, white supremacist or far-right uh, terror entity on the national terror list? Um, so that's our, uh, our, terrorist, our terrorist designation list. And I think the easiest way for me to explain why that is is by sharing with you um, the designation criteria, uh, which reads that the entity has knowingly carried out or has knowingly participated in an attempt to conduct one or more terrorist acts. And so there's a certain um, degree to which uh, uh, actually activity and particularly international designation plays into our system. Mm -hmm. It does, however, not mean that that is the only way that you become an entity or individual of concern to our authorities. That is not true. It is, is, however, one mechanism where we stop the financial flow and the financing of terrorist activity into these organised groups. Mm -hmm. Some security experts, though, would like to see that list as a way to, I guess, curb those groups and to stop the financial flow going into them. So could you, yeah, change it? Yeah, change the yeah. and so in order for the financial flows to be stopped, it does by default um, uh, require there to be a level of um, organisation, even if it, it is relatively sophisticated, and for the entity to be identified and designated. You can see the criteria is quite specific around what's required to meet that threshold. But again, no one should for a moment think that if you are not on our uh, designation list, that you are not an entity or individual of concern. That is, that is not true. Uh, it is just one of our mechanisms for where we identify people of concern. Is that 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 we know that it's though, should it change? It is tightly defined, but that's because by default it then needs to be the existence of an organised entity. Um, and that's one of the ways that we do that. My understanding, uh, but I will check this, is that our designation is fairly similar to other countries in the way that we work. Uh, also, of course, if some, a group is designated uh, by an international body, the UN, uh, we don't replicate it in our domestic legislation, ne- necessarily. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, Thomas, I did say I'd come to you, and then I'll come to you, Richard. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Julie Anderson said she only understood the full mechanics of her electorate, unique electorate um, agreement, yeah, and the latter half of 2020. She now says she should have understood that since 2017 you know, onwards. Are you happy that she's told the full truth throughout this time about her unique? Yeah, look, my, what I'm concerned about is making sure that our MPs are meeting the rules that apply to them, and be it through the Electoral Commission or through parliamentary services. Uh, of course, you know, as, as you're aware, uh, the arrangement that has existed there historically has now changed as of the election. It's not unusual that that would happen when lease arrangements come up, and it's not unusual for MPs to inherit arrangements that they subsequently change. Now that we know that all things oh, ultimately all of our arrangements, if they're being checked by parliamentary services and the electoral commission, are being examined by others and by the entities that really have a role in making sure that what should be happening on behalf of taxpayers is. Now that we know that Do you know? Sky and then I'll come to you, um, Ben. Yep. Um, now that we know that Auckland Sky Path is going to be delayed, how much longer will people have to wait to be able to walk? Or bike over the we all want to see um, Auckland connected and the ability for people to be able to move uh, across from the shore over into central Auckland um, by walking and cycling. You know, the issue that we've encountered is since we've, of course, had you know the recent uh, engineering fallout from the accident on the Harbour Bridge, that has posed some challenges. What we need to do is make sure that when we set up that ability to move between the two, we do it safely. Is it is a completely different structure needed given all of those engineering problems? And that's a question that I think we're rightly asking Waka Kotahi. What's it going to take to make this happen? Is it still feasible and viable to do it through the original plans? Do we need to think of other options? Ultimately, though, that goal that we have to build that connection by walking and cycling so that you're not... Uh, you know, you're not confined by car across the Harbour Bridge. We all still share that. We're all still working towards that. Right now, could one of them be given over to cyclists in the meantime? 
Um, that's not a question I've ever asked, but I think what we would want is for the option to be sustainable in the long term. We know that there are capacity constraints, and I wouldn't want to actually unnecessarily set up this friction between the two when what we want is multimodal transport. Only, only half of the Australian states are open to New Zealand yes. passengers without, tra- travellers without... Thank you for quality. highlighting that. No worries. Um, <laughs> will, when New Zealand opens for Australian uh, travellers, am I getting this the right way around? Yes, confused, yes. You, um, will you only be open to those three Australian states or will it be open to whichever states choose to take up your offer? Yeah, and so we would we would be looking to make sure that you know those that we deem to be safe we would be open to, unless there were an issue in any particular state in which you would close. Of course, the most obvious factor for us is where there is current the ability the currently the ability to move between the two, sure. and that's so, not the case everywhere. So it's going to have reciprocal. Yeah, so it, for us it would be if it's safe then we'd be opening up even regardless of whether or not you actually had a, the ability to travel between the two or not. You previously had two different timeframes for opening the bubble. Um, and you've walked away for those for different reasons. Can you give an absolute guarantee? That the, the, the I had to, have I? We gave the general first quarter suggestion. You, you also said it to Harper last year that September was realistic, but then the Melbourne bubble quashed that because it was yes, a it did. So You'd forgive us that one then, I, I, obviously. I, yeah, for sure. <laughs> will you give an absolute guarantee that the date you nominate on April 6th will be... The and, that's why, that, and that is why we'll be announcing it on the 6th of April, because I want... At that time that we give that date, I want it to be something we can stick to. Keep in mind uh, that it will be the case with this opening that if at any given time there is an outbreak, we will have a closure because that's how we maintain freedom. Have the states have Richard? Sorry. um, What would happen if either Australia or New Zealand unilaterally opened to a third country? Oh, then we would then we would of course you know review our uh, settings. Uh, So look at whether or not it changed up the risk profile at all. And that was another thing that we were working through country by country, Joe, when we were working at that level. Then we were talking about how would we deal with third country entry into a bubble. But we'll now have to just deal with that separately as it arises. Other than Australia and the Pacific Islands, yeah. and, 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 who has approached New Zealand uh, looking to set up? Oh, the look, there, there's been a number, of, some of them actually were very, very early on, and they were more caveated. If at some point we're able to open up, let's keep up talks. Um, and so, uh, obviously, um, Fiji has been interested for, for some time, uh, and you've already heard the suggestion from Singapore. What about Taiwan? Oh, I would need to go back and see whether or not that was officially raised. Forgive me, Henry. How much All right. of a factor is the vaccination? I, and then of... I'll come to you, Mark, and then I might wrap if that's OK. How much of a factor is the vaccination of both countries' border workers? Because once they're all vaccinated, uh, the risk of an outbreak from MIQ is much, much lower. Well, it, it is lessened, absolutely, it is lessened. But no, that actually hasn't factored into our thinking. You know, obviously we've been working on this since um, since before the vaccine started rolling out. Um, so no, it's an added benefit, but it's not contingent. Our opening is not contingent on that being completed. Yeah. The, had the Proud Boys, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. The Proud Boys, the base, Adam is, is there any, would you like to take another look at And I don't, to be fair, I'm just not au fait enough with the, the process that Canada uses in order to designate. Um, but international activity can be used if they, you know, international activity can be used to meet our uh, criteria. But again, as I've said, the entity has knowingly carried out or has knowingly participated in an attempt to conduct one or more terrorist acts. Um, Again, though, you know, we do keep this under rolling review and not for a moment should anyone look at that list and say that New Ze- that is the, the, the full scope of what con- New Zealand considers uh, to be a group of risk or concern or violence. Okay, thank you, everyone.